Good morning. Uh, my name is John Kong, and I'd like to welcome this group to the symposium entitled uh, Future of Living Kidney Transplantation, uh, Evolving National Perspectives in Kidney Transplant. It's sponsored by the National Kidney Donation Organization and the group Weightless Zero. This is being hosted by the University of Chicago, and I do want to make a disclaimer that the opinions expressed during the symposium are those of the individual speakers and do not necessarily reflect the stance or viewpoints of their respective institutions. So why are we here today? We're really talking about the disparity between the wait list and the number of transplants. And even though last year we reached a record number of transplants for all transplants last year, there were over 40,000 done, but still the wait list is quite long, large and uh, the disparity is primarily uh, evident in uh, the kidney transplantation uh, realm where there are over 100,000 patients waiting for less than 20,000 kidneys. As a result, the median waiting time for kidney transplantation continues to increase. And as you can see in this slide, the association between wait time list for to kidney uh, deceased donor kidney transplantation and the mortality uh, are highly correlated. So during the symposium, you'll be hearing uh, from a number of really uh, excellent speakers. Um, the organizers and myself and Philip Held, uh, who is a well-renowned uh, healthcare e economist uh, and has written uh, many pivotal and important papers in the realm of transplantation. I won't go over each of the speakers because they'll be introduced um, as we go through the, the um, symposium, but I, I think you'll find all of the topics of um, will be uh, intellectually challenging, and in some cases quite controversial. I would also like to highlight what we think, uh, Philip and I think, ed, uh, learning objections will be. Um, and again, uh, these are uh, uh, objectives that may be construed as being biased and uh, somewhat controversial, but to understand what the limits of the position of rewarding donors is medically and ethical, and, uh, the failures of the current altruistic system uh, and organ donation, impact of organ uh, shortage uh, in poor transplantation related to preventable deaths and social and, and economic losses. Um, what types of actions can be done to increase the availability of kidney donors? And what are the expansion limits of the uh, deceased don donor supply? What are the U.S. Uh, population's attitudes regarding compensation or rewarding um, organ donors, the potential benefits for the government uh, in terms of ending the organ shortage related to the overall benefits and costs to society, patients, and caregivers, what the impact will be on organ donor sharing, the risks and safety of organ donation, and that Organization, uh, lastly, that donation is not easy or costless, but it, the rewards, as we all know, are substantial. Thank you, Dr. Fung, for your introduction, and especially thank you for having been the host for this symposium. I'm going to recap a number of points made by Dr. Fung, a little bit different approach. Making two points, kidney failure is primarily a disease of the poor, but kid kidney transplantation is partly is primarily the treatment of the not so poor. I will give you two graphics to d demonstrate that. But before going there, I mentioned that there is a law in the U.S. with a prohibition against rewarding donors in any fashion of anything of value. Now, here's three points I would make as a consequence of this prohibition. One, it increased the waiting list from 4,000 people to about 125,000 people today. 
The 4,000 would have been the case when the law was passed approximately 26, 36 years ago, pardon me. This prohibition led to kidney shortages and many other associated problems. And the third point I want to make, which is the most important for this symposium, that this law, I would suggest, led to a remarkable inequitable allocation of kidney transplants. And for those who are unaware, fundamentally, any person with kidney failure in the U.S. is covered under the Medicare insurance program. So the inequitable allocation that I'm going to point to shortly uh, are really a consequence or a, are part of the Medicare insurance program that uh, covers all dialysis patients and transplant patients in the U.S. Two graphics on this point. Number one graphic here, looking at uh, a the distribution of a large sample of new dialysis patients according to their educational attainment going across the x-axis from less than a high school graduate to a college degree. The vertical bar indicates the ratio of this percent of new dialysis patients to the percent of the general population that are in that educational category. So, for example, the 2.86, let's round that to 3, says that new dialysis patients are three times represented in terms of proportions compared to the general population of, of the population with that educational level. In other words, the uneducated are much more likely to be a dialysis patient than their numbers in the general population would suggest. Dialysis patients are overrepresented in that least educated group. On the extreme right, you see the college degree. The vertical bars are substantially smaller. In fact, they're dramatically less than one, suggesting that college degree new dialysis patients are not nearly as common as college degree folks in the general population. Going to the second slide, um, looking at the where do the transplant recipients go uh, or how do they fall out in terms of this educational distribution, you can see it's the exact opposite slope Take, for example, the less than high school, and again, we're talking about the percent who would receive a transplant ultimately from this sample compared to the number of dialysis patients in that group. So the less than high school graduate, the least educated, and the least lowest income in this distribution are hardly represented at all. In other words, they have a very small fraction of their numbers would receive a transplant compared to the uh, numbers of dialysis patients. Going to the right, you see that the opposite of what we saw of the incidence of kidney failure is that college degree dialysis patients are much more likely to get a transplant. In fact, they're about twice as likely of what they would be if they were distributed evenly according to this distribution of educated dialysis patients. So this is looking from left to right. You see that more education, you're more likely to be transplanted. And it's, it's quite dramatic. And um, it's the exact same opposite of what we saw in the prior graphic where if you were uh, if you were a new dialysis patient, you'd be very unlikely to be in that category of a college degree. Here's an, another look at it somewhat different, comparing uh, black dialysis patients with non-black dialysis patients and looking at a transplant rate as to see, in this case, breaking it into two groups of deceased donor 
transplants and living donor transplants. And we see that in the right group, the deceased donors, uh, the black compared to the non-black are modestly comparable. I mean, certainly is a lower number for the for the black deceased donor. But if we look at the left group, which is with the living donors, uh, which is very much, uh, it's a dramatically lower rate for blacks compared to non-blacks. And the, re the re relevance of this is in looking to the future as to where you could have substantial expansion, I mean, dramatic expansion in the number of donors, it's in living donors uh, where that is po possible. And in this as shown here, of course, the current system does not bring forth black living donors uh, compared to non-blacks. Going on to what this symposium is really about, I'll give you an overview of the different speakers and what they'll be speaking about. And again, we'll be starting with um, uh, in rewarding donors or the e ethics of that. In fact, I could summarize the first session or the first session focus is, is it ethical or unethical to reward donors in some sense? We will follow that ethics discussion by a, some proposed policies of what, what you might to, to implement such a program. And that will be followed by a discussion of five members of the speaking of our speakers who will be discussing again this general question of the ethics of transplantation. Other topics and speakers which will follow will be uh, opening by a Nobel laureate Alvin Roth Dr. Roth from Stanford University, who will be speaking on organ exchange, which is a very significant part of the new uh, transplantation procedures for living donors. Uh, this is the work that the, for which Dr. Roth received the Nobel Laureate. He will be followed by an excellent new paper on the costs and benefits of rewarding donors. And it turns out that uh, this, th th this work is going to certainly cause a number of sparks, I think, in the community. That will be followed by a speaker discussing uh, the current barriers to living donor transplant. That is, what are the things that could be changed today without changing this prohibition law in terms of increasing living donors. That would be followed by other related topics, which is, uh, you'll see here a number. One, we have a speaker, a woman, who was a living donor and wrote a very uh, popular and impressive book on the experiences. Um, we will have a physician uh, speaking on public attitudes rewarding donors. Uh, and that is, was beyond to me, was quite surprising, the results that I'll be speaking to you about what Americans think about rewarding don donors. Um, we have an excellent speaker on the risk and safeguards for living donors, uh, followed by the limits of increased counts of deceased donor transplants. As I mentioned before, the big expansion possible is in the uh, increased, uh, the big expansion possible is from living donors. And there's a general perception that there's all sorts of possible deceased donors but what is not commonly recognized is that only 2% of deaths in the U.S. are actually potential uh, deceased donors. Very definite limit to the deceased donor 
transplant expansion. Weightless Zero, uh, the founder and director of that organization is here to speak, and he'll be speaking of the role of Weightless Zero's role in living donation. Next, I'll go to a general summary of where we expect to go with this uh, following the symposium. A symposium summary will be published article or a published article, which is a symposium summary, will, is planned with first offer by Dr. Ojo, the Dean of the Medical School at the University of Kansas. You should also be on the lookout for a new website, rewardinglivingdonors.org, or uh, we'll be, we're in the process of establishing such an institution. Now, however, in the very near future, copies of these symposium presentations will be available at these two websites, one of them, uh, uh, which is at the NKDO, one of the uh, sponsors of this organization, as listed by Dr. Um, Fung, and they will also be making a presentation on YouTube of these of this symposium. Here's a quick picture of uh, all the persons participating in this, and uh, we can uh, you can go with that at your leisure let, let, let next time. I now would like to introduce our first speaker, which, as I said earlier, will be focused on the issue of the ethics of compensating or rewarding donors. Our speaker is Janet Radcliffe Richards, who comes to us from Oxford. And she, and I would suggest in a lot of ways, is the world's expert on the question of the ethics of transplants. And I hold here her book, The Ethics of Transplants, with the subtitle of Why Careless Thought Costs Lives. And uh, I heartily recommend the book, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy uh, Dr. Richard's discussion here of the ethics of transplantation. Dr. Richards, you have the floor. I'm an academic philosopher, not a medic, not an economist, not anyone with any special interest in transplants. But I got involved in this subject a long time ago when the controversy about rewarding donors first arose. And it so happened that at the time I was experimenting with journalism and I wrote a little article, which I didn't expect to think any more about. It was published in one of the British newspapers. And as it happened, it was picked up by a transplant surgeon and he got me to come to a conference. And somehow, although this was 33 years ago, I have not been able to escape the subject since. And here it is again. So I'm back again on the subject. Right. So let's have the beginnings. This, this really was when the business of payment for organs first came up. There were Turkish peasants. The newspapers discovered that a couple of Turkish peasants had come to Harley Street. Harley Street, as many of you will know, is the London street which has expensive doctors and rich clients. And that they had come to sell their kidneys to two, I think they were Arabs or something like that. They were rich anyway. Um, and it was discovered suddenly. It took everybody by surprise. And there was a reaction of total horror, pretty well universal. It was from the medical profession, the lawyers, the politicians, and most of the public. And they were all talking about the greedy rich who were trying to take 
the very bodies of the poor, exploited people who already had almost nothing. They were taking the last thing they had. And they were all horrified by it. And the reaction was immediate. One of the surgeons involved was struck off the register. Others were sent for ethical training. And there was rapid legislation, the quickest legislation I can ever remember in Britain to forbid payment. And it was followed rapidly also in the rest of the world as well. And it was denounced by the WHO, which has now got as part of its policy that payment for donation is absolutely unacceptable. It was followed by the declaration of Istanbul, which repeated the same thing. And it wasn't just that you weren't allowed to advertise organs for sale. They went to, in different places, they made different deliberate policies to try and avoid the slightest risk or taint of payment. So in Britain, for instance, we had extra hopes for donors to go through to make sure they were related to the people who were wanting the transplant. And there were all kinds of rules to make sure you didn't pay more than expenses. You weren't allowed to profit slightly from the donation. So everybody really was horrified by it. And what struck me was that it was, it was really extraordinary that everybody was so agreed and so surprised and so horrified because after all, medicine had for some time tried to make organs transplantable. They had deliberately made it possible to get a bit of one person's body and move it to another person's body and still be usable. And indeed, to take it from living persons in the case of kidneys in the first instance and move them into other people. That is, they had been trying to make organs into the kind of goods that you could transfer between one person and another. It's just what they've been trying to do. And they're in short supply, as is well known. A lot of people needed transplants. And people who are desperate to keep their lives, save their lives or get off dialysis, will try very hard to get these organs that they want. And if others are willing to sell, of course the market will be develop. Now, it was rather interesting. I think the doctors somehow had been so concentrating on trying to save the lives of the people who needed transplants that they had got somehow got a focused view of this as a mere doctor-patient-donor transaction. And it hadn't occurred to them that other people were noticing that kidneys had been made transferable. And it wasn't even a case of rich capitalists thinking here is a new way we can make money. It was discovered that in developing countries where people were poor, they would actually be accosting passing doctors and saying, do you know how I can sell my kidney? This was absolutely spontaneous. And people saw an opportunity in both directions. The other thing was, why did they all think it was so obviously wrong? Now, the law had already had to be shifted to allow living donation because doctors are not allowed to harm a patient, even with that patient's consent. So normally in law, it, uh, according to traditional law, you would not have been allowed to cut into somebody and remove a kidney when it wasn't for the benefit of the person you were removing it from. But it had already been accepted in law that taking a, a living donor's kidney was sufficiently safe and the benefits sufficiently great that it should be allowed. So that had already been established. Then you have the fact that surgeons were positively encouraging people who needed transplants to see if they could find a living related donor. And that means that the surgeons were 
confident that the donor would not come to harm. The surgeons would not want a string of dead donors on their books. So it was obviously regarded as a good thing by the medical profession. And all you needed was the informed consent of the donor. And in ordinary life, what we are free to give, we're normally free to sell. It's true of anything else we own. If we can give it, we can sell it. So why did people think it was wrong? Why did it seem so obviously outrageous that we had to bring in a law to prevent something which obviously wasn't prevented by existing law? This was a new thing. Of course, it was a new development. We weren't yet used to transplants in everyday life. And we had to bring in a new law. But why? What was wrong with it? Because the thing that struck me about it when I first encountered the case was what had happened. We had patted ourselves on the back to say about how quickly we had pre prevented some kind of harm, how we had stopped a terrible thing from happening. And what we were doing was returning the original potential recipient to dialysis and at least or death and at least a shorter life. We had returned the potential donor. In this case, it had been someone who wanted the money to pay for treatment for his daughter who had leukemia and for which there was no free treatment in Turkey. So he wanted to pay for his daughter's cure and he was returned to the death of his daughter. They were both turned, returned to a situation which was worse for them. They had hoped to escape it. And we, thinking that we were present, pre preventing some great harm, had returned them to this bad situation they were in. We had obstructed a mutually beneficial voluntary exchange which didn't harm anybody else. Now, normally, if two people want to exchange something and it's a good thing for both of them and they don't harm anyone else, we see no reason in a free society why they should be stopped. And we were actually preventing two lots of badly off people, one ill person, one person who was poor and wanted to save a member of his family. We were preventing them from making themselves better off than they were already. Now, it is extraordinary that that was regarded as so obviously a thing that had to be stopped. It seems incompatible with all our normal values. It was making people worse off. Why were we doing it? And that was what I wrote the article about. Now, as a philosopher, my concern is with the details of reasoning, not with medical facts or economic facts or anything of the sort. It was just the logic of how the arguments worked. And a lot of what you have to do to get an argument clear, to get a debate organized clear, is to organize it first. You have to see how to present it. Otherwise, people will bring in ideas from all directions and they just get mixed up in a mess. What that we have to do is get the debate organized. So, the first thing that went wrong was the kind of thing I was pulled into right from the beginning when I started talking about this. I had given this argument against prohibition, saying we shouldn't ban it. And from then on, I kept being invited to conferences where they felt they had to give both sides of the question. One side for organ selling, the other side against organ selling. Now, this was a serious distortion of the issues, just presenting them like that, because it made it sound as though the for organ selling side people were people who thought it was a good idea and we should have a free market. And I was described as the philosopher who says that the poor should get out of poverty by selling their organs or that we should 
be encouraging trade in all directions. I had said nothing of the sort. The question is not for or against in the sense of people who are for love the idea and think it should be encouraged. Yes, I was also described as an enthusiast for organ selling, which I'm not. Um, for or against, it shouldn't be set up like that. It should be set up much more carefully as, there you are, shouldn't be that, Totals people who are totally against donor payment think it should be absolutely forbidden. And the people who are not totally against it, that doesn't mean they're of, in favour of a free-for-all markets and all the rest of it. It just means they don't think there should be an absolute pro prohibition. So that's what the first debate is. And it's important that the debate as a whole has to be seen on two levels. First, what fundamental principles are we going to take as fixed before we start the detailed policy debates? And then secondly, having got those principles in place, we then go on to the debate about the policies. Now, what I'm concerned at the moment is the fundamental principles, because what the reaction to the discovery of organ selling did was try to make it into a fundamental principle of transplant practice that there must be no payment ever. Now, we start with quite a lot of fundamental principles in ordinary medical practice. For instance, we start with an absolute principle of no murder. So suppose transplanters wanted to come along and say, well, look, if we could just murder a few people, we could cut them up and save lots of people with all their organs. We could argue that, and the society could have a debate about whether we should allow murder, that society has had that kind of debate. We do not allow murdering people for the benefit of others. We have an absolute rule about no kidnapping people to steal their organs. We say you're not allowed to hold a gun to someone's head and say, I'll shoot you unless you give me your organ. You're not allowed to coerce them. You're not allowed to take anybody's kidney without their informed consent. And we all regard those as fundamental principles. The debate about those we've already had, and we regard them as absolutes, which we are not allowed to contravene. So the question is, can no payment or reward for kidney donation be added to that list of fundamental principles. We're not yet saying what would a good policy for getting organs be, or would it be dangerous or anything we're saying, is it a fundamental principle which should never be overridden? So that's the question we're asking first. So anybody who thinks there should be a fundamental principle of no organs, no kidney selling, no selling of any organs, they need to explain to the rest of it why. If you think something should be a principle, you should be able to explain to people why you want that principle accepted. So there's a challenge, and it's a very simple challenge. Tell me why you think the law should totally forbid organ selling. Now, that means that what you're doing the challenge is you must provide an argument which leads you to the conclusion, therefore donor payment should be prohibited. This is setting it out in a way that we can easily look at and assess rather than just the sort of mass of stuff that is put into an ordinary debate that's disorganized. Now, we've got a lot of basic principles of medical ethics, which is agreed to, which are agreed to by all the people I know of who object to allowing payment. So we've got these background ethics principles. Most of us think it's presumptively good to save lives. Presumptively means if you don't know anything against it, you would always try to save a life if you could presumptively good, it might be overridden, but it's 
generally presumed to be good. We generally say that competent adults should decide their own best interests. That's the principle of autonomy, which is basically accepted in medicine now. People should be free to make mutually beneficial exchanges that don't harm anyone else. Well, that's just a general background freedom that we all agree to. It's not particularly medical, it's just general. It's presumptively bad to take away options from anybody. If you want to take away anyone's options, you need to give reasons for it. Right, so everyone I know in the organs debates accepts those fundamental principles of ethics. So we're not just asking, why do you think organs payment, payment for organs should be prohibited? We're saying, given all these background ideas that you have, that there's a presumption against these things, how can you accept these basic principles at the beginning and reach the conclusion that payment should be prohibited. Now it looks very difficult. So the challenge amounts to, you need to put in a but. You need to put in an objection, some reason why you shouldn't, which is going to override all those presumptions of ordinary medical ethics that are in favor of allowing donor payment. So what can we put there? Now, I can tell you from years of experience that there are hundreds of them, and I can't go through them now in detail. I can tell you that I have often used this debate to supply a whole semester's worth of material for teaching logic in practical ethics. But let me tell you some of the things that came up and give you a quick response. This was the first one I heard from the very surgeon who invited me <laughs> to the first conference. You can't allow organ sellers to do it because they haven't given genuine consent and genuine consent is a requirement. They're vulnerable and uneducated. They don't know what they're doing. They're from poor countries. We can't allow them to do it. But the trouble is, quite simply, uh, there are several objections. First is, these people from these uneducated countries are actually regarded in ordinary medical practice as competent to give consent for ordinary operations. They're regarded as capable of giving consent to civil contracts. So why aren't they regarded as giving, uh, capable of giving consent in this case? And anyway, Medical practice says you don't make a general presumption that people are not capable of giving valid consent. The medical practice is to presume they are and only to say they aren't if you have evidence in that particular case. That is not an argument any doctor should accept to ban organ sales. Then another one about the vendors. They're coerced by poverty, which makes their consent invalid. Well, it's true that they wouldn't sell their kidney unless they needed money. But is that coercion? Think about what poverty is. Poverty is actually a state of having not enough options which makes you have to make choices, which people with more choices, more options, don't have to make. But if you take away this option of organ selling from somebody because they have few options, what are you doing? You're taking away the one option they seem to have of selling their organ and leaving them with even fewer, which is hardly a thing which is a good way to deal with people who are coerced by poverty. You're making them even worse off. The vendors are presented with unrefusable offers. They're dazzled by these things which are put in front of them, this money that they haven't seen before, and that makes their consent invalid. Well, if you're saying that they have somehow become un incompetent because they're dazzled, once again, you have to prove that they are incompetent. And actually, there's no reason why you should think anyone is 
incompetent because they are refusing more money than they've ever had a chance to get in their life before. Even if you think they're incompetent, a decent, dis someone deciding, a proxy deciding on their behalf in their own good would very often say it would be a huge bonus to these people to get the offer. It depends how much it is. But that is a case for caution. It's not a justification for preventing everything. Um, then they say we should be lifting them out of poverty, not letting them sell their organs. Well, by all means, lift them out of poverty. It would be excellent to lift them out of poverty. But that is not a justification for preventing them from taking their best option when they are in poverty. Get rid of the poverty and then, if you're right, nobody would want to sell. You don't need to make rules to prevent what would not happen anyway. We should be trying to get them out of poverty, certainly, but that does not justify the conclusion that they should not sell. Vendors are wrong to think they will benefit. This is another one. People who are totally opposed to organ selling will go around collecting all the evidence of the people who have sold their kidneys and got into trouble. And I don't doubt that they have. But opponents don't usually go around finding to see if anybody has benefited and are pleased by it. But never mind about that. The fact is ben vendors could benefit from selling organs, but these the evidence which they're getting, because selling is prohibited, all the evidence they're getting is from people in a black market with no controls. You cannot look at a black market and conclude from that that some kind of legal controlled market would have the same results. This is just ridiculous. You need the proper evidence first, and we have no evidence because organ selling is illegal. And say, this is another argument that comes up, it will lead to a black market if we allow selling organs to happen. It won't lead to a black market. I mean, there will be a black market. Black markets can happen whatever happens. But at the moment, we are not allowing anything except a black market. And we know that black market does harm. And that is that would be a separate reason, apart from any others, for allowing selling, even if it were intrinsically undesirable. People are being exploited. Well, no doubt they are being exploited in an uncontrolled market. But there is no necessary exploitation in being allowed to sell a kidney. The point about exploitation is rather subtle. What people do when they're exploiting other people is to take advantage of their poverty to pay them less than you would have to pay them if they were not poor. That's what exploitation is. But from the point of view of the exploited, people who are being exploited are being exploited because it is better to take this low offer than to take nothing. And you can't help them by removing this option altogether. You can only help them by giving them a better option. To say you protect the exploited by removing the opportunity altogether is like saying you are protecting slum dwellers by knocking down slums. The only way you can help slum dwellers is to give them something better than slums, not to take away what they have. It's a commodification of the body. This is often said. Well, it is. But the point is, the commodification of the body, turning it into something which can be passed from one person to another, is exactly what medicine has done in making transplantation possible. The question we're asking is the commodification, is making making it into a commodity in other ways bad. And that is to say it's a commodification as though that shows it's bad is just begging the question. The question we're asking is, is it reasonable for money to be exchanged for the donation of a kidney? 
So that's a useless argument. This is another common one. It's just like slavery. We don't allow body, but people to be slave to be slaves. Why should we allow body parts to be passed around? Well, that's a silly argument because slavery is a matter of owning other people so that you treat the whole person as property. This is not a like, like that at all, because this is saying we're allowing people to treat their own body parts as something that is their property, which is what we are doing when we allow consent to living donation anyway. We're allowing people to say, you can say what happens to your kidney. It's nothing like slavery. Organ donation must be altruistic, with an exclamation mark. Well, this just isn't an argument at all, because we have no general principle that nothing must, that some things must not happen unless they are altruistic, unpaid. That, again, begs the question. It presupposes the point at issue. If you want to show that organ donation must not be paid for, you can't just say, it must be altruistic, meaning not paid for, because that's just stating the same thing in other terms and pretending to give an argument for it, which you haven't. It is wrong for the rich to have benefits available to the poor. Well, even if it were rich, wrong for individuals to have rich individuals to have benefits available to the poor, that doesn't show that you shouldn't have some kind of public service buying these organs and making them available to everybody, which is what is often proposed. But anyway, I find it very hard to believe that anybody involved in the American, <laughs> the United States medical system can say it is wrong for the rich to have benefits available to the poor when there are so many people who are uninsured and don't have access to decent medical care. That is all about the rich having benefits available, unavailable to the poor. Buying organs is queue jumping and that's unfair. Well, that again is, is implying that individuals are getting them. But anyway, what an individual does if you buy an organ and finance it yourself in a way that's separate from the public system, that is taking yourself out of the queue rather than pushing into the queue, which is quite different thing. Incompatible with human dignity. This is the last resort of a lot of people who can't think of anything else. Now, it's just an assertion as it stands. If you want anyone else to accept that this is incompatible with human dignity and that therefore they should say it is not allowed, you have first given account of human dignity which you accept, and then can, we have to consider whether we accept that definition. And then you have to say that it follows from it that you should not have payment for organs. Now, I have never seen either a description, an account of human dignity, which would seem to have this implication, or any demonstration of how the illegitimacy of payment for organs follows from it. So this is a straight challenge, a two-level challenge to anyone who says it. My feeling is that by normal modern standards, it's incompatible with human dignity to say that two competent people should not be allowed to say what they want to happen with an exchange between them, or that some human should be regarded as say your dignity it's incompatible with your dignity we must prevent you from selling when we might say it's important to my dignity that i should be allowed to take a choice about what is good for me and harms nobody else so that can't just be left standing unchallenged we need to know why and whether we accept that there are better ways of getting organs. Well, of course there are, but if there are better ways of getting organs, go and get them. Don't just stop what might be the best way we have available. 
And finally, it seems to come to this, it's just wrong. It's just something we know is wrong and we have to add it to the list. Well, maybe, but we haven't any reason to think so yet. They said this, this is the idea that when saying it's wrong, you've reached moral, moral bedrock. There is no further justification to give. Well, all these arguments are trying to give a reason and they all fail. So if you actually do accept it as a separate freestanding principle, you must recognize that it's overriding all these other values in terms of which it's been trying to be justified. It is not something which follows from the other values, which is normally it's presented as being. It is something which actually overrides them, curtails autonomy, limits our ability to save lives and all that kind of thing. So there are all those fundamental principles. And notice that all those fundamental principles are all about rights we want individuals to have. This bottom one is not a right, it's a restriction. Maybe you want to insist that it's a necessary fundamental principle, but it's not like the others and it overrides them. So, I want to conclude that the absolute prohibition as a fundamental principle of payment is not a corollary of accepted principles of ethics, but actually overrides them, is against them. By all our normal standards of ethics, it's a mistake to think that payment for donation is wrong in principle, that it's unethical. And I do want to see, say this is a mistake. The way people normally argue, they're saying it's all in line with our normal principles of ethics. It isn't. As a matter of logic, it is actually in conflict with them. This is like a mathematician saying, looking at the designs for a bridge. I have found a mistake in your calculations. You'd better put it right or the bridge will go wrong. The mathematician is not saying I'm telling you how to build bridges. I'm not telling you what policies you should have for organizing organ donation. I am simply saying as a philosopher that there's something wrong with the basic logic of all this the basic feeling that it is incompatible with our normal principles of ethics to allow payment. It is quite the reverse. So make sure you know where you're having the debate. First, is there any absolute pro prohibition, principle for absolute prohibition? And I have said that is simply inconsistent with most of our general principles of medicine. People may have their particular religious objections to payment for organs, but that would be a matter for their particular religions, certainly not as a justified in a country which does not have religion as a general base of, basis for what the law should be. And then when we've got that out of the way, we then say, what policies should we have given that there is no fundamental objection to payment. We might want to limit payment in all kinds of ways, but we don't want to start with the idea that there is a fundamental objection which closes off that option before we begin. So we will not have this familiar format of the debate because if you try to do it as just a single debate for or against, it misrepresents both of the two parts of the question. The first question is only about whether it should be prohibited absolutely. It isn't about whether you like the idea or want to encourage it. Sorry. The second is about how to make the arrangements of our new ability to transfer organs from one person to another. And we don't even need to bring up the question of for or against. We just say what dangers are inherent in these new abilities of ours and how should we guard against them while keeping all the opportunities open for improving things that they give us. And this is my moral as a philosopher. If you die through mistakes in moral reasoning, 
you are as dead as if you die through mistakes in medicine. People who die as a result of our thinking too quickly that it's in our normal moral principles that we should forbid payment, those peoples are dying through a mistake in logic, like people who die through the collapse of a bridge through a mathematical miscalculation. And so where I think the problem is, there's an overall situation which is completely new. We come from a background of transplantation being a new thing because we have never had a situation in history where we could take an organ safely from one living person and use it to save another. In the past, cutting a person open and taking organs out of them is either a desperate, horrible measure of surgery or it's something aggressive, torture, trying to kill them. It's quite different now, and our intuitions have not adjusted to this new situation. If we forbid the selling of organs, it makes us feel less uncomfortable about it. We're horrified at the idea of somebody wanting to get payment for an organ. It sounds desperate. It sounds like selling your teeth in the 18th century or selling your breast milk for um, wet nursing. And that, that's nothing like as bad as this. It sounds like a terrible thing to do to a person, but it is not because we encourage living donation. So it's unjustified to try and make ourselves feel uncomfortable. Uh, feel ourselves less uncomfortable. Another immediate effect is to prevent sick people from saving their lives and remove options from people who would be willing to sell. We're actually making things worse by prohibiting for two sets of people. We're making ourselves feel comfortable. We're making two disadvantaged sets of people feel less, worse off. So the challenges are we who are rich and healthy by prohibiting any payment for organ donation just making ourselves feel comfortable at their expense now i have a suspicion that that is a matter of psychology is what we're doing at any rate i can't find any rational justification for a total prohibition and therefore we should be willing to look into proposals which might make things better for everybody if we simply allowed payment. Everybody else in all this is allowed payment. We don't say the surgeons have to be altruistic. We say the surgeons can be paid. Why shouldn't a donor? Thank you. That is the philosopher's view. Thank you, Janet, for that excellent presentation on the ethics of compensating the donor. Um, I am sure that this will be cited for many years. I now will turn to introducing Dr. Sally Sattel who is uh, at the American Enterprise Institute and Yale University and is abundantly qualified to address the second question that Dr. Richards mentioned, which is the idea of, well, after the introduction of, or the addressing the issue of the ethics of transplantation, what about the practical issues that follow from that in terms of how you would implement such a program. Dr. Sattel will give a uh, presentation on one possible plan that might be implemented, and she will be followed in a discussion by Dr. Matus of Minnesota, Dr. Alvin Roth, Nobel Prize winner from Stanford U University, and Dr. Sharfuddin from Indiana U University. This should be a good discussion, 
And again, this will be following Sally Sattel's presentation. Thank you, Phil. Um, Janet, I have to say that was a masterclass in argumentation, um, just impeccable logic. And I feel that you refuted the claim that compensating donors is unethical. And then you pretty much said that once we uh, resolve that question, or first we have to resolve that question before we can get on to talking about policy. And I'm going to take 10 minutes, not much more, to talk a little about that policy and what I think it should, and what I think it should look like. Um, basically, as, Ch as Janet was saying, in some sense, this debate about organs it exists in a parallel universe to what we um, normally live in, which is to say that um, we're especially concerned, uh, for example, and I, I think rightly so, but that people who might engage in uh, re what I would call the system of rewarding donors uh, might regret having entered into that. You know, they might they might rush into it impulsively, and and then regret it afterwards. And that's something we want to avoid. Of course, we we entertain that and we tolerate it in, in, in the universe generally, but in this situation, it's something we want to avoid. And I certainly agree with it. And in the real world, we'd like to avoid it too, but we don't ban people from enter, entering the exchanges because of that concern. Uh, and the other thing that we uh, tolerate in the real world, and maybe we shouldn't tolerate as much, that's another debate, is the idea that uh, um, people who are well off may benefit while people who are uh, disadvantaged um, you know, don't. Um, and uh, again, that's the real world, but we are talking about we are talking about a novel enterprise here. and uh, and I think that uh, going out of our way to, address those concerns is extremely important and, and politically viable. Otherwise, I think there'd be no chance of, of having at least a pilot trial of incentivizing donors, which is something I'd like to see very much. So um, let me now uh, t talk about what kinds of general policy um, parameters we would need to have in place to address those two concerns. One, uh, the idea that people would impulsively rush into something and then regret it. And two, that that only the wealthy could benefit. Um, now, I should say I am the poster girl for altruistic organ donation because two people over the years have given me ki their kidneys. And uh, obviously, uh, I would be here talking to you uh, today or I'd be on dialysis in a much, I mean, thank God it exists for sure, but it's a very debilitating uh, procedure for many. And it, it, it uh, no matter how well you do on it, it inevitably foreshortens your life. So I'm enormously grateful to that. And of course, any system of compensation would exist side by side with the standard, what we call today, altruistic um, organ donation. Um, I certainly think altruism can co coincide with a person being rewarded for saving someone's life, uh, but that's how this debate has kind of uh, 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 settled out. You're either for organ for altruistic organ donor, or you will, um, or, or you uh, are uh, will accept the notion that people should be uh, compensated, rewarded for their kidney. So, if we are to think about a system that would compensate people, what, what should it look like? Well, to go back to those two things, uh, two strictures that I talked about before, uh, worrying about people who would impulsively act and then regret it. Well, you can never really guarantee regret, but or that people won't regret what they do. But to, um, to curtail impulse, impulsive action, what we would do is not offer what a desperate person wants, what a desperate person would rush into, uh, and that is immediate cash. So the kinds of programs uh, that, that have been written about, um, uh, and you'll maybe hear more about them for Dr. Matus later, but they don't include a lump sum of, of cash because that is what a desperate person wants. And we wouldn't uh, permit, and yes, this is paternalistic, there's no question about it. Um, we wouldn't permit um, people to... Um, engage in uh, donating their organ in a compensated system unless they uh, there was a built-in waiting period. 
um, I'd say six months, could be a year. Um, it takes a while to do it anyway, even if you do, don't want to donate the most conventional sense. But um, this way, if you put in a waiting period or cooling off period, that will um, that will suppress the, the, the concern about impulsively rushing into something. And of course, we're talking mainly about poor people. We don't want a desperately poor person to rush into something they're going to regret. Um, and those are the protections against that no cash offers and a waiting period, possibly even a, becoming a certified donor, um, the way we get the certified scuba diver that, that you're so you know infinitely well informed about this. Uh, clearly anyone who wants to go through with this would go through the same procedure that an altruistic donor goes through, a conventional donor, because there's the intermediary uh, institution of the hospital and um, and all the protections of informed consent and the health of the donor, the health of the uh, recipient uh, will be taken into account. Um, so what are the possible, um, oh, pardon me, and the second um, uh, constraint is again, how we would, uh, how we would defray the concern about only people who could afford to participate um, uh, being advantaged over those who couldn't. Well, the solution is pretty obvious. You'd have a third party being the, the compensating agent, and that could either be the government or a charity. But in this way, um, only p it, one's uh, financial assets would not be uh, considered at, at all. Um, there'd be no private exchanges. I'm personally not against private exchanges, but again, I think for a politically acceptable, a palpable, uh, excuse me, a, a palatable system, we could not have private exchanges. And also, um, one could institute an income floor, which is to say, you have to make twice poverty level in order to uh, in order to donate in a compensated system. But I think that, um, as Janet was saying before. That that uh, is is unfair to uh, people who are low income. It's it's it is in, indulging in that um, in that belief that people who are low income are incapable of making decisions in their own best interest. And it's it's I think the system I'm talking about is quite, is paternalistic as it is, but that is a, too paternalistic. Um, uh, and so so how could we? What kinds of systems might uh, might, might work? Um, and again, this is where pilot trials come in. I know Dr. Um, Sharmodin was talking about we don't have enough data. Well, let's generate our data. Um, one idea, for example, and I've written about this with a tax expert in detail, and I can send you it later. But one uh, one suggestion, for example, is a tax is a, a tax credit. Uh, Fifty thousand dollars, for some reason, seems to be the intuitively uh, agreed upon uh, amount that uh, seems right uh, to compensate. We really don't know, but again, that's an empirical question. Will that attract folks? Um, anyway, that would be distributed over a ten-year period. Um, actually, Janet also had mentioned um, she could imagine people who are middle class. Uh, and otherwise this financially secure being interested in such a proposition. Um, and I can tell you they are, but I've gotten, I've gotten so many letters from people, especially during the 2008 period when there was a lot of financial stress in the United States. And folks said to me, I would, this was in response to an article I'd written. And they said, I would love to be able to uh, save a life and save my house and, and be able to, to donate and do this. And, and the intermingling of financial and humanitarian impulse is very, very common in people who are receptive to participating in such a system. Um, polls show that. And also just, I have mountains of, of letters from people. Although I'm less concerned than, than Dr. Sharbudin about a person's, um, uh, motivation for wanting to participate as, as long as it's realistic. And this is all, you know, people do go through psychological exams before they donate. Anyone does. And, um, you know, if it's unrealistic, uh, then that's a different matter. But, um, but just the fact that people need the money to do something, e even if they didn't have this, this warm fellow feeling, which most do seem to, uh, to me, that would be, uh, a, that would certainly be a trade off worth having because at the end of it, you would save someone's life and, and basically save the life of their family as well. Um, because, you know, if you wanted to give a kidney to save your mother, you could say that's altruistic, but in some sense, it's profoundly selfish. You want your mom. And uh, and you would do pretty much anything 
And uh, uh, in fact, this is one of the only situations where, you know, short of rushing into a burning building or dragging someone out of a frozen pond, you can save a life in an immediate way. Uh, and people should be, again, allowed to do that. Um, I'll finish up by saying that, uh, you know, again, I've heard a lot about commodification claims. And when you think about it, um, uh, it does make little sense since the whole process is, is commodified and that everyone gets paid for it, the surge in the hospital. Um, what I've um, derived from the debates that I've been in and the articles I've read uh, is that um, people are using that commodification argument as uh, basically code for this is not addicted, this will not, this will violate human dignity. And again, I'll close by saying that, um, you know, when you have a system where there's respect for autonomy, you pay the person enough so that you're not taking advantage of them. And that's what exploitation means. Uh, you express gratitude for their sacrifice and you ensure their safety. It's hard to see how any, any dignity is being violated there. Um, I have a few more things to say about the donor bond, uh, which at mine is very strong, but uh, that's uh, to have more good donor bonds in the world uh, is not a reason to ban uh, organ donation. Uh, that was uh, an item that Dr. Um, Sherwood mentioned. Uh, we could have crowding out, possibly. There might be some people who say, well, if someone is getting paid, I don't want that I'm not going to donate. That certainly throws into question the whole animating motive of, of altruism. But in that case, well, fine. If you don't want to donate, then 10 people might because they could be rewarded for doing this and it would improve their prospects and that of their family. I'm going to stop now. I could go on. But uh, thank you all very much for your time. I look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Sally. Um, as uh, I've always observed with you, you do a wonderful job on this. Uh, but we do have to move on. But thank you. You were also on time. Um, we are scheduled to have a roundtable type of uh, interactions here. Uh, we are behind schedule, but I, uh, I've asked uh, for the uh, e electronic folks to give us 15 minutes. And uh, uh, joining this group of uh, would be... Uh, Dr. Alvin Roth and Arthur Matmatis. And so beginning with Sally, Dr. Shishar um, uh, we, we have quite a group here. And um, let me uh, ask Dr. Sharfuddin, maybe you would like to ask the first question in this round table, uh, if you wouldn't mind, thank you. Uh, thank you, Philip. Uh, again, I apologize for running over time. I really wanted to show my slide upon xenotransplantation, which, uh, you know, as we all know, has, uh, has uh, created a lot of stir and interest in the last um, uh, few months with the, uh, the pig heart and the, the pig kidneys. Uh, that, that was a, an a amazing discussion uh, uh, and talk uh, from Dr. Richards and from Dr. Sattel. My, my first question would be, um, you know, we don't have data right now. And just talking about what Dr. Satel was saying, if you propose this, what would be the first step considering all the aspects we've just talked about, you know, from um, choosing a donor, um, social issues, um, the um, coercion, consent, exploitation, the choice and autonomy as far, and then the, the, the steps, where would we start? Who would like to take uh, that question yeah. on? Okay, to Sally, you, you, oh, would you like to I was gonna suggest, that? well, I can, but I was, since I've spoken and this is, we have a short period of time and I, Art, would you like to address that? Well, the first step is to change the law. Um, because you can't that, yeah. do this without changing the law. It's currently illegal. Um, and then I think you have to um, decide what your trials are going to be, but you have to set up a practical system to run the trials. Um, and I would suggest we run it through the infrastructure of the OPOs. So there's no reason that the OPOs can't do a donor evaluation in the same way that our current centers do a donor evaluation. 
and use similar acceptance criteria. And the OPOs could be responsible for uh, overseeing the entire process, in, including the including the uh, provision of the incentive. Um, that's that's so the where general I audience. May I just add? There are that OPO is the organ procurement organizations. There's about fifty seven of them in the country Thank that you. are yeah. very much active in re recruiting or procuring organs from a deceased donor. Sorry. Correct. They, they have the infrastructure for for deceased donor procurement, and there, there's no reason that couldn't be expanded. And so change the law and set up the infrastructure, define the infrastructure, and then consider trials. And, and I, I would do this like any other trial, you know, which a trial requires informed consent, just like, just like anything else. Let me add here that... Um Dr. Matis has been attacked more than once for proposing clinical trials. I find it personally a bit surprising that academics uh, in this community are in the business of uh, attacking someone who is proposing a scientific uh, answer to these questions. Um, uh, uh, Al? Uh, Al is our honored guest here. He uh, has the Nobel Prize, and I've specifically asked him here in this particular part of, the, of our program for the specific uh, question which he first came to me and said he would like to discuss with Janet Radcliffe Richards the issue of repugnance. Al? Well, Okay. Uh, you know, there are, it turns out selling a kidney isn't the only thing we, we don't allow. Uh, there are a lot of repugnant transactions, by which I, I tend to mean transactions that some people would like to engage in, but other people who aren't directly involved uh, think they shouldn't be allowed to, uh, normally for reasons that they phrase in moral terms. So just to, to pick another example, let me use surrogacy, uh, which is... Um, paying someone to bear a baby for you. Uh, that's illegal in much of Western Europe. It's legal in England, but but it's like organ donation. You can be a surrogate and, and parental rights are, are uh, recognized, but you can't pay the surrogate. So there aren't a lot of surrogates in England. And in the United States, in almost all the states, commercial surrogacy is legal. You can uh, come to California where I live uh, and going through uh, uh, relatively now well-established contracting and, and judicial process, uh, you can have your name on the baby's birth certificate uh, and a California surrogate will will bear the baby for you, getting paid around somewhere in the fifty to $75,000 range. Um, so there's lots of controversy of those sorts. And I have two questions for, for Dr. Radcliffe Richards. One is, how do you see the connection between those very different kinds of of discussions that we have about different markets. And the other, you know, you've been such a, a tireless advocate. Um, I was wondering what experience you can share with us about how, how, when and how you've been successful in convincing people to change their minds. Well, I think Arthur Metas was probably the first, or did you get there before me? <laughs> um, I'm... I don't regard myself as an expert in mind changing, except with people who are happy to follow arguments. Um, I think the surrogacy one raises all kinds of problems which the organs one doesn't, just because it involves children, and that makes life tremendously difficult. Um, but I don't think repugnance is a justification for not doing it. It may be a justification for controlling it in certain ways. But do you think it's a justification for not doing it? Uh, I think the repugnance, no, I the repugnance in the case of organs anyway, it's because it's so recent and, and the mere business of cutting into somebody and taking an organ out of them is, is just disgusting intuitively until you understand how good the medicine is. Um, I think people will get over that. I hope they don't get over too quickly the surrogacy one, but I don't but again I don't think payment is the issue. It's what sort of controls you have. 
Okay. Uh, Dr. Mont Montes, would, sorry, go, go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go, go ahead. So oh, the I was just wondering, wondering if you have any thoughts on, on the difference in, in say, uh, how, how the difference in, in legal arrangements has arisen in, say, France, where surrogacy isn't recognized at all, in Britain, where it is recognized, mm -hmm. but you can't pay. It's like kidneys. And in the U.S., mm -hmm. where we allow commercial surrogacy, but, of course, don't allow kidney sales. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, just shows there's a lot of moral confusion in bioethics. And there is, because <laughs> the world is changing so quickly. Our intuitions just aren't keeping up. But I think it's rather serious when people are dying and suffering from poverty because we have intuitions. <laughs> we might have to overcome our intuitions. And repugnance isn't really, sorry, repugnance isn't really a moral value, right? No. I mean, no. there's lots of things that people have considered repugnant in the past. But we now think well, the, the fact that they thought them were uh, repugnant is actually repugnant. I mean, you know, you can you have a whole list of things like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have a question for Dr. Mayers. Um I, I, I like your answer about, you know, starting off with the first step. Um, what do you think about the other things which we are not currently doing in the country, such as the higher discard rates we have, um, expanding KPDs? I mean, um, there are other opportunities as well at this point which can maximize organ transplantation. I, I absolutely agree. Every opportunity to maximize organ transplantation should, uh, should occur. But I've been listening to this argument about maximizing organ transplantation for decades, and it hasn't happened. And meanwhile, 8,000 people a year on the U.S. waiting list, never mind the world waiting list, 8,000 people a year on the U.S. waiting list either die or are taken off because they become too sick to transplant. That's kidney alone. I mean, how long do we have to wait before we try this? I mean, you know, everybody says something, something is going to come along that's going to be the magic answer. It hasn't happened, which is why I think trials are justified. Let me make a quick comment on that wasted organ idea. The work we have done on the cost of of, of uh, the cost of the o, of the uh, OPOs, uh, I certainly got the impression that it seems like twenty percent, which is the general notion of the number of recently dead donor organs that are wasted here. It seems to to occur across all. Uh, at all at all at avenues that I've look, looked at, and I certainly get the impression that it just seems to be a byproduct of uh, this process. If if anything in particular, the allocation process, where there is, I mean, there's considerable concern and talk about uh, how long it takes between the time that an organ is offered. And somebody, particularly some surgeon, says yes. Uh, I was shocked to find out that the typical organ is offered 16 to 16 different potential surgeons before it's accepted. 16 for a deceased donor organ, which we know cold time makes it extremely important that that process be speeded up. But at any rate, it seems to me that uh, it's certainly... <laughs> So 20% is not a small number, and certainly things would be the benefit, but I don't think it's as e easy to fix as, as some people think. And, uh, I mean, for for example, some, some of the things that I hear is that, you know, wow, they, that OPO went out to procure organs, and they only got one kidney uh, in, in the process. But the work that uh, Dr. McCormick and I have done shows, you know, the value and it, it's funny, we we on the on 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 the on the economic side are accused of not knowing value and only can focus on cost and price. And in this case, we've been trying to push this community to think about value. And when you think that the value of a kidney is about one point five, one point six million dollars, uh, that we're we're. we're <laughs> We, we should not hear complaints about they went out to do a recovery and they only got one kidney. Uh, so anyway, uh, 
Can I? Sorry, S Sally? No, no. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. I just wanted to uh, mention, I do think um, that technology will, will save us. Um, uh, it may be in 10 years as you know, transplantation, and I realize diff there'll be different rates for different organs, but in kidneys, it may be 10 years, it may be 15, but, uh, but another, um, uh, you know, frame for this is we can use compensation to clear out the list now before we have the rescuing technology so that when that comes online, we really will be able to uh, take people as they come on onto the list. Whereas now, even if, uh, you know, is, you know, transplantation, pig kidneys were available tomorrow, they'd never be able to gear up that quickly to, to, to address the list. But if we whittle that list down considerably, mm -hmm. you know, through all the other, uh, you know, for a thousand, let a thousand organs blue, let's do it every way we can. Mm -hmm. But as everyone has said so far, all the efforts have not worked um, well. And if we can help with that 20% discard rate, great, but that's still not enough. And let's clear it out by rewarding people. Uh, we reward, as uh, Dr. Um, as Al mentioned, you pay, you know, you offer, you offer uh, money and you get. And um, this, this, this situation uh, it would, should be no different if somehow it is the one exception in the universe. Um, a, a pilot trial uh, can, can show us that. But um, anyway, that's just another way to think about this is as, as a temporary uh, kind of a, a process until, until technology takes over. I would like to bring in a question from the audience. Uh, Dr. Robert Gutman, uh, who I'm sure is known by many people, says, I hope Dr. Richards will talk about enrolling in armed forces as a model and paid for pregnancy surrogacy. Dr. Richards? What about armed forces? Well, I've always wanted to tell a story. You know, I was, a, for most of you people were born, I was a navigator on a Navy patrol plane off the coast of China, a lot of risk. And, you know, I was paid Risk pay. I got a hundred bucks a month. Right. My, of course, I guess had a my point is. Pardon but me. I haven't thought what the question was. Oh, as well, an incentive the, to, to kill yourself, be killed in combat. <laughs> effective, well, effective, well, you know, I would put the question about we well, certainly they ask take, they, people to take risk. They do it just automatically, deep um, oil drills and the drilling rigs and things. They pay extra money, steeple jacks. <laughs> um, we had a big I'm debate about the, the... I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I'm, I'm not saying what the answers to any of these are. My, my only thing is to remove an obstacle which doesn't even allow you to think about it. And incidentally, I think the whole of organ procurement and not just the payment is full of all kinds of little practices which have become entrenched in the medical profession and which get in the way. Um, there, are, there are an amazing number of obstacles to organ oh, well. donation which need to be got rid of. Things like not being allowed to say who the uh, recipient is. So mm -hmm. the deceased donation. But, um, well, that they all need review. One more thank uh, point you about. Uh, uh, okay, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no go I was just going to say just about the the practices um, oh. and the framework we have in the country. You know, when you said twenty percent discard rate, we all know the reasons for that, and there are other reasons why we don't accept organs. We're worried about our metrics, our outcomes, mm -hmm. our payment mm -hmm. plans, our contracts. Uh, you fall below a certain. Uh, observed expected ratio and you may get shut down that does not allow us to take risks on the disease side mm -hmm. so there are other things obviously we can also do and dr Maitis would agree which which also have to be fixed quickly you know if you want to let's say like uh, like sally just said let's want to clean up this quickly well, there are other ways to do it as well but you know this has been a lively discussion thank you yeah go ahead uh, um let, let me just uh Add to that that all most all these problems I think you can trace back to the shortage of organs. That's why people do all this uh, stuff of worrying about their scorecards and so forth. It's the shortage of organs. But at that point, I'm going to call an end to this group. We're going to a break now, but to try to make up time uh, rather than ten minutes for the break, 
How about five minutes for the break? Dr. Asif Sharfuddin is uh, the director of the Kidney and Pancreas Program. Uh, that's the Kidney and Pancreas Transplantation Program at the at Indiana University. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Sharfuddin. You have the floor. All right. Good morning. Hope you all can hear me. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to discuss this very important topic and um, perhaps some may view this a little bit controversial as well. Um, again, I'm honored and privileged to be here in the presence of uh, world-renowned speakers, Dr. Maris, Dr. Radcliffe um, Richards, um, Dr. Held, Dr. Roth. Uh, thank you again for having me. All right, I have no disclosures about this talk. Um, I always wonder when anyone's giving a talk, you know, you are representing what you do and what you've been trained for and what your educational background is. So I am a transplant nephrologist, so I do take care of transplant patients and I do evaluate living donors as well and I do counsel them. So my background with for this topic and discussion comes with, with that kind of um, uh, you know, education. And again, I always have wondered, you know, does that change the way I view things? And probably does. I, I'm sure all of us who are experts in our field, we all look at it in a different way. All right. What I would like to do today is um, divide the the topics um, in a few broad categories. And I am representing the um, opposition towards um, or being financially rewarded for organ donation. So I'll go over a few things such as the definitions and then some of the declarations which have been done um, across the world, uh, the Helsinki, the Istanbul Declaration, followed by, um, you know, what are the real concerns of rewarding living donors financially um, in terms of exploitation, coercion, discuss a little bit about, you know, what is the significance, non-medical significance to the donors when they do donate and do this altruistic gift. And when are these donors thinking about um, possibly getting financially rewarded? What are the circumstances which may have a donor consider this gift, monetary gift? Um, and then we'll discuss a little bit about, you know, what does consent mean in the setting of financial rewards? We have our usual consent, medical consent, informed consent, and we do any procedure but how does um, a change in the background of this um, transaction affect the, the consent uh, process? Give a few examples about what's happened in different parts of the world as well. And finally, try to see if there's a dollar amount which could be attributed to this and does that really make any sense or not? Eric, if you can enlarge the screen a little bit. Thank you. All right, so let's talk about definition of donation. Um, if you look at any dictionary and you know Oxford Dictionary or so on, what is donation? It's a gift um, of a charitable nature. It's a voluntary transfer of property or, um, or money. You can donate to charities um, from the transferer, which is a donor, to the transferee, who's the donee or the recipient, with no exchange of value of any considerable part on the part of the recipient. So the recipient gives nothing in exchange for the donated property. Or in our case, we're going to be talking about, you know, is there a third party involved who would compensate the donor for something which the recipient receives? So let's try to make a distinction between what is a commodity and what's a gift or um, a, a donation. Donation is of a kidneys that's definitely regarded as an admirable act. Um, Precisely because it's you know it creates a little bit of burden and has a tiny small uh, but quantifiable risk for being an organ donor. I'm going to specifically talk about kidney donation here. Uh, obviously, some of these things could be applied towards liver living donation as well. Um, so, paying a dollar amount for something which is inherent in the donation turns the gift, which is in this case the kidney, uh, into possibly what may some people consider as a market commodity. A commodity whose value has no fixed determination and obviously would vary from person to person or from country to country or region to region or background to background. 
we all know there are some inherent, very low, but not insignificant risks to organ donation. For example, you know, there's a risk of death with kidney donation, about one in 3,000. Similarly, donors can end up in kidney failure themselves, about three to four out of 1,000 people at some point in their lifespan can end up with um, kidney, uh, kidney failure, either requiring dialysis or needing transplant themselves. Generally, when we are financially rewarded, we're doing it for a job or a task. We work, we get paid. For other voluntary acts we do, not necessarily organ donation or anything else, we're commended or admired for those things. Let's talk a little bit about what is financial neutrality. So the principle of financial neutrality in the setting of organ donation or kidney transplantation means that donors and their families neither lose nor gain financially as a, as a result of donation. Now, this has been the long-standing component of multiple societies across the world, ethical uh, committees, the Transplantation Society, WHO, um, and the, uh, including the uh, NOTA, National Organ Transplantation Act of 1984 in the United States. Um, and this is also um, upheld by various um, global societies, including the Istanbul Declaration. So it is emphasized that the act of donation should remain a transaction of financial neutrality. Let's talk a little bit about the international consensus and declarations. Um, I'm sure we're all familiar with the Istanbul um, Declaration on Organ Trafficking and Transplantism. Now, clearly that's a little specific towards um, transplant tourism and organ trafficking, where there is a clear exchange of um, money or to the donor in rewards uh, in rewarding them for donation. So, in that declaration, I've taken small parts of it, not the whole declaration, which is a very long document. The organization should be a financially neutral act. Transplant commercialism is really a pol is a policy or practice in which an organ is treated as a commodity, including being bought or sold or used for material gain. Organs for transportation should be equitably allocated within countries or jurisdictions to suitable recipients without regard to gender, ethnicity, religion, and particularly focusing here or for social or financial status. My emphasis here would be the financial status. Financial considerations or material gain of any part must not really influence the application of relevant allocation rules. Every country, every region, including ours, you know, our, in our country, we have rules which are set to fairly and equitably allocate organs, deceased organs, as well as living organs. The primary objective of transplant policies, uh, policies and programs of any country, any region, um, should be really the optimal short and long-term medical care to promote the health of recipients and also having safeguards for donors. Just a few more points about the uh, Declaration of Istanbul on Organ Trafficking and Transplant Tourism. So comprehensive reimbursement of actual documented costs of donation of an organ does not really constitute a payment of an organ, but it's part of the legitimate cost of treating the recipient. For example, all the cost of uh, the medical costs of organ donation, organ testing, follow-up care of the, the do living donor are all covered by a government entity or an institution or an insurance plan. And the relevant costs um, should be calculated and administered using you know, transparent methodology consistent with the national norms um, or institutional policies. Reimbursement of, of approved costs should be made directly to the party supplying the service, such as the hospital that provided the donor's medical care. And the reimbursement of donors' lost income and out-of-pocket expenses should be administered by the agency handling the transplant rather than pay directly from the recipient to the donor. So direct transaction between recipient and donor should not happen. Now, the other legitimate expenses that may be reimbursed when, when documented um, would be other parts of the evaluation, right. um, which you uh, know, psychological evaluation, medical evaluation, follow-up care, um, other um, non-medical costs for the donor, which include perhaps uh, travel, uh, long-distance phone calls, accommodation, um, lost income consistent with national norms. So what are the costs which we cover? and what we don't cover at this point. Um, obviously, we cover all the expenses related to donation, screenings, pre
pre-op care, peri-op care, any possible readmissions. Uh, if there's a new medical condition, which we think is related to the act of donation, counseling, pre- and post-donation, short-term, long-term complications, any disability related to donation, um, travel costs, um, perhaps visa, uh, uh, obtaining a visa, uh, travel for caregiver, job loss, uh, lost wages, tuition costs. Now, some of them are covered, and some are some of these costs are um, argue that they should be covered, and there are um, national legislations being passed to hopefully get these approved across the nation and not have uh, variations across the country. What do we not cover at this point? Um, those are things such as household chores, uh, rents, mortgage of the donor or their family or things they need at home, food, basic expenses of living, family expenses, um, gas. And nowadays, it's things are getting expensive. Um, or alleviating any other hardship or debt which they have at this point. Um, those are expenses which a lot of people argue should not be covered. And that's the discussion in this in this um, uh, conference today. Um, should we be rewarding them to cover these expenses which the donors should have been taking care of themselves? Now, obviously, there are multiple, many people who are not able to afford these things and they be live below the poverty line but they are otherwise medically suitable to donate if they want to, either to a loved one or even altruistically. What is coercion? Um, so if you go through the Helsinki Declaration, the particular needs of the economically and medically disadvantaged must be recognized. And we have to pay special attention um, to those who may be subject to giving any kind of consent, not necessarily just for the um, act of donation under duress or stress or pressure. So can we consider or should we consider the need for money in our after donation or during the process of donation, uh, a duress or a stress? Is that considered coercion? And I would argue, I think that does fall under that category or definition. Let's talk about exploitation. And when we talk about exploitation, we have to go into the social determinants of health. And we are all um, very aware of these aspects, especially nowadays, um, where minorities or people who have lack of access towards transplantation or medical care tend to um, suffer due to um, social issues of health, not necessarily their own uh, the independent medical issues. Um, for example, everyone's aware of the, the the um, removal of the uh, uh, race coefficient in the EGFR formula, uh, which I'm very glad is being being implemented across the country, and UNOS and other organizations have, uh, and ASN and AST have supported that. That's a good step. Um, then uh, back in 2014, the new kidney allocation system um, gave time back to the recipients who unfortunately would not come forward for perhaps financial reasons or social reasons to get transplanted. And then they, they would wait four or five, six years to get to a transplant. But nowadays um, they get priority because the time to on wait list is um, retro, retrospectively dated back to their first dialysis. That's on the recipient side. Um, but let's talk about on the donor side. Okay. So for example, you know, can there be exploitation of the recipient by the donor um, before or after donation? and in terms of exchange of money? Or can there be expression of the donor due to the circumstances? Um, or is the donor doing it only for the prospects of payments? Or do they have other reasons to donate? Uh, we generally do think that you know, poverty or lack of financial uh, means makes people desperate. Or they want to do things which they not necessarily would have done or make decisions which they not necessarily would have made. So uh, I don't want to, want to use the market and organs, but I think we do need to use that term um, gently and carefully. Um, so if there is a financial trade involved in organ donation, um, it would likely be most attractive to those who are perhaps poor or who live in poverty or who are not well off socially and don't have many alternatives. Um, so it's possible that there would be disparities in these populations who would tend to accept payments. And who do we think will most likely step up to be donors if financial rewards uh, were implemented? 
do we think that the wealthy or the well-off or the affluent population um, will they want to come up first, or will it be the poorest in society who may want to be the um, people who want to donate in order to get rewarded financially? Other arguments against paid incentives for donation exploitation: If we have a system in an organ donation uh, which rewards the donors financially, um, the ability to pay would really be determined by who would buy organs. Now, this is a, a slightly different aspect to this because um, we're not talking about the recipient directly compensating the living donor, um, but it likely it's possible that it's the poorest of the society or the ones who are well off who would think about uh, being organ donors to get a financial reward. And again, such an unequal distribution of health benefits, which as it is exists in our, in our um, uh, medical health practice um, would burden and would not be just. Now let's move over to the um, emotional attachments and the relevance of organ donation. So, you know, adding a materialistic component to this altruistic act, uh, whether it's to a loved one or to um, uh, an unknown stranger or a distant relative, um, really has a, a special meaning to the donors and the recipients. Donors gain a very deep sense of satisfaction from their act of kindness or generosity. Um, could this monetary reward taint that sense of satisfaction? They will always possibly live with this feeling. Well, I did this, but I also got money for it. And was this the right thing to do? Um, they they have significant positive emotional experiences. Um, clearly, they're they're saving somebody's life, and that's the psychological reward they go through. And um, this the experience of providing the special gift to the recipient who is in need of an organ donation um, quite often is a significant change in someone's life. And they, they go on to do different things down the road. And that positive aspect of donation is the force behind um, quite often their future careers and lives. Um, they also, donors also uh, experience this kind of bodily identity extension. They know that my kidney or, for example, liver is in, my, in that recipient. Or not even, they may not even know who it is. But they have this sense of satisfaction feeling, well, I have helped someone. By adding a monetary reward to it, will that change? Um, you know, donors and recipients, especially when they know who the recipient is, they share this very, very special, um, perhaps unquantifiable bond, which is sacred and pure. Um, I'm sure all of us know families, uh, recipients and donors and pairs and couples, where they go out and they celebrate anniversaries of their um, organ donation. And um, and they enjoy and they they, they have um, they they can reflect on what's happened and they the donors can see how the recipients are faring and doing uh, with with that act of gift they've given. Um, there's some data, and I, I'm not trying to um, say anything about a particular country, but it is what it is. We have uh, what's available across the world, and we have to use experiences from other parts of the world to discuss this, these topics. Um, so data from Iran and India have shown that experienced um, uh, donors who have donated, um, they, they actually have emotional and social harms in the stigma that they face because their family, their community, um, they know that they actually got compensated for being an organ donor, for selling a part of the body. And that is uh, a negative experience to them. Um, they did not have the same reward which they would have had if they had done this in a financial neutral way. Let's talk about circumstances. So, you know, some of the arguments, arguments which have been made about uh, being compensated for living donation is, well, this could fix their problems. They have financial worries. They are out of a job. They're trying to support some family member through college. Um, they need to buy this or that or really pay for medical care, um, pay, get insurance. Well, um, that does sound good. But at the same time, is that going to fix the problem uh, temporarily or will it fix it uh, forever? Um, and at the same time, is this enabling them to come out of proper, um, their, their circumstances or conditions? 
or are we helping them to become independent? And those are arguments which I would say is is unknown. I don't think we know that because we don't have that information at this point. Now, clearly, in different parts of the world, um, many individuals, unfortunately, donate kidneys to release themselves from actual bonded slavery. And this, unfortunately, happens in many parts of the world, um, but have insufficient capital to make a new life. And often, after that temporary phase of having um, a change in their, their circumstances, they often return back to debt. Now, here in the United States, um, obviously, we find it difficult to relate to concepts such as slavery or entrapment or bonded slavery. Um, but how would we as a society view individuals in our own country if they're driven to donate a kidney to pay off their credit card debt or fees or satisfy a drug problem? And who knows how they would use that amount of money, right? Let's now move over to consent. Um, we have our standard consents. You know, we explain the medical risks to a particular um, patient candidate for going through that procedure. And I'm sure all of us are very well versed with what uh, informed consent or consent is to uh, a kidney donor. And you know, multiple safeguards are taken. We have the independent living donor advocate who goes through all this to um, explain to the donor that hey, these are your consent. These are your risks, um, not just medically psychologically, financially, um, and, and the, the candidate then consents and moves forward. Now, if we add the component of monetary rewards, will it be the same consent? You know, does the quality um, of consent remain the same? It perhaps it is difficult to assess how a, a donor candidate would view that consent, um, and that could certainly make it problematic. It could perhaps cloud the judgment of the donor by the lower of the monetary gains. Now, the other part then is, you know, many individuals or possible candidates could be being pressured by their family members. Um, it's not, it's the, the monetary sum they're expecting may not even go to the individual candidate who takes the risk, but it could be given in the background and behind to somebody else. Uh, we, very often, we just don't know what's happening with the with the donor's background or their lives, um, I am sure. Even nowadays, at some point, we have missed situations despite having multiple steps through the donation um, consent process. There has been some kind of non um, uh, quantifiable gain to the donor in some way. Uh, you know, for example, the employers um, who sometimes have an employee step up. Um, you know, clearly we are able. We try our best to stop that from happening, but its I don't think we can 100% guarantee and say that it doesn't happen in the background. And we have obviously no clue what's happening in, within family dynamics, um, who's being pressured to do what. So in other words, financial incentives um, you know, could encourage people to do things they would not otherwise do. And is that really willful consent? Incentives um, to do things are which possibly have a little risk to them and that may change the way they judge that procedure. And that possibly can make people's actions, consents, and decisions less autonomous or less voluntary. Um, so those are the aspects about consent in organ donation. Um, I am from Pakistan. okay, um, But again, I don't want to use countries' names, but I think we have to use um, the data we have available. Um, we all know that Iran is the only country, as far as I know, where there is a regulated compensation for donors. But looking at some data um, from, um, uh, which is in the literature, that you know, compensation for donation has occurred in many parts of the world. Um, unfortunately, it occurs, even now it occurs, legally uh, only in Iran, but illegally probably in many parts of the world. So in 2007, um, over 2,500 renal transplants were performed in Pakistan, of which more than 70% were from uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged kidney vendors. And more than half of these recipients were foreigners who paid um, anywhere between twenty thirty thousand dollars $30,000 to go, uh, so people from outside of the of Pakistan, to receive a kidney and then they travel back to wherever, uh, whichever part of the world. Um, you know, this is obviously we're talking about third world country and recipients of vendor cut kidneys, you know, because of poor assessment, poor screening, poor healthcare. Um, had uh, poor outcomes on the recipient side, and and so did the donors. 
and they have uh, lots of medical complications. And um, in Iran, the way it currently works, and again, we don't have exact details of how they do this because not published very well, is there is the regular paid donor to uh, around $1,500 um, uh, or so, $1,200 per year, uh, uh, $1,200 to the donor. And this they do about 1,500 to 200 transplants per year. Um, now, they claim that the graft survival rates are similar, so they have a system in place to to take care of the donors as well as the recipients. Now, in addition to the a set amount of um, money given to the donor, um, there's also additional monies which could be negotiated between the recipient donor pair in order to move forward. Okay, perfect. That should be done by five minutes. Um, so um, other parts of the world have also sh uh, shown similar things. And, and Philippines had done this uh, a few years ago. And there was a flourishment of, um, you know, uh, um, organ trade. And then they had to stop it and scale it back. Now, um, India has also gone through the same situation in the past where, um, you know, they're, 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 they've shown that people have um, not really had a, a good experience, the donors. Um, many of them remained in debt even after donation. They got the compensation roughly $1,000 or so. Uh, they spent them temporarily on debts and food and clothing. Um, but during uh, after the surgery, they actually had a decline in the overall family income situation. And the majority of them uh, did not recommend that they would do this again. Obviously, they can't do it again, but they would not recommend others to do it because it did not help their financial situation. Clearly, it's a different situation. We're talking about um, a third world country where the needs of a person's life and their economic status is different from what it is right now in the United States. And how do we give a value to this, this transaction? And how do we compensate? You know, what should be given? Um, can we quantify the physical, psychological burdens of donation in terms of financial terms? And does one value fit for all? What about related, unrelated, or altruistic donors? Should the reward be the same or should it be different? Uh, just because you're giving it to your brother and you are in need of money or you need to have some money to go forward or should be higher, for example, somebody who's altruistic and say, I'm not giving it to anybody I know, but why not? I should probably get more than the person who's given to his brother. And then let's talk about, you know, we should also discuss, you know, um, the undocumented immigrants in this country. Um, so uh, $1,000 in the United States will certainly go a long way in different parts of the world. If somebody decides to come over, for example, from Mexico to donate and go back, um, you know, that for them could be enough. Um, but for other parts, uh, for other people in the United States, that sum may not be enough. And then finally, um, recipient attitudes. How would the recipient feel if they knew that a donor was being paid for their organ donation? Would they accept it? Um, generally, recipients, you know, if, when we talk to recipients and they ask, well, I'm not going to have my son or my brother donate because I'm not, I don't want them to go through risk. They are typically not concerned about that. I'd like to now present a wrap up following our presentations. And the question is, what is next? What follows this symposium? What is the so what? Uh, about this symposium. Let me mention uh, three items. One, a symposium, symposium summaries, should be plural, would be a, is a published article or articles are planned with the first author, Dr. Ojo. Dr. Ojo is the Dean of the University of Kansas Medical School. He will be, uh, first author of that article, and I'm sure you can find it in the lit literature, it will be a few months away. Number two, you might be on the lookout for a new website that we're going to be organizing. Uh, the name, of course, is Rewarding Living Donors. And number three, uh, the symposium for presentations um, uh, which have been edited and produced into a very professional copy by our good folks at Soundworks. Uh, there'll be two presentation or two websites 
where the symposium presentations are available. And the one is, uh, well, uh, it's here on the web on the graphic, uh, and it's at NKDO, National Kidney Donor Donation Organization, which is, if you reflect back to Dr. Fong, is one of the sponsors of this um, symposium. And they also are putting a copy of these same um, audiovisual presentations of the symposium at a YouTube site, which is also shown here on the screen. Thank you for attending. Uh, we're very honored by uh, the attention we've received. And this uh, certainly has been a work of love for everybody involved.